Good morning. Today is the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. The day is devoted to the 10th anniversary of the UN Declaration on, Indigenous, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was adopted by the General Assembly in 2007. So it's the 10th anniversary of this landmark declaration. A special event today at 3 p.m. in the ECOSOC chamber will feature high-level remarks and a brief film screening and also a panel of experts to discuss the progress and the challenges in realizing the rights of indigenous peoples. And we have three experts here with us today to provide an overview of where we stand um, after a decade of, of the landmark declaration. So the first speaker here is Ms. Mariam Wale Abu Bakrin. She's the current chairperson of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She's a medical doctor from Timbuktu in Mali and a member of the Tin Hinan, a women's association focused on indigenous peoples in Africa, particularly the Tuareg. In the middle, we have Grand Chief Wilton Littlechild. He's a Cree chief and lawyer from Canada. He's a founding member of the Indigenous Initiative for Peace and a former member of Parliament. He also served on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and as a Vice President of the Indigenous Parliament of the Americas. And on the far side, we have Chandra Roy Henriksen, the Chief of the Secretariat of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in the Division for Social Policy and Development of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. So I'll hand it over to our speakers. Um, and by the way, we have interpretation in English Channel 1 and French Channel 2. Um, Ms. Abu Bakrin, we'll start with you. Je vous remercie, madame. Et je vous remercie à vous tous qui êtes ici pour célébrer avec nous cette journée internationale des peuples autochtones, mais également euh, le dixième anniversaire de la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. Donc, permettez-moi de reconnaître ici la présence de son honorable monsieur, euh, huit, euh, le chef euh, Wittelchild, euh, qui est un des, grands, euh, des grandes personnalités qui ont lutté euh, pour euh, la reconnaissance des droits des peuples autochtones. Donc, si je reviens brièvement sur euh, cette journée internationale des peuples autochtones, euh, elle marque pour moi euh, l'unité euh, des peuples autochtones du monde entier, parce que rappelons que cette journée du 9 août était la première euh, journée où euh, les peuples autochtones du monde entier s'étaient rencontrés à l'occasion du groupe de travail euh, sur, les peuples, sur les populations autochtones en 1982. Donc, à la suite de cette rencontre, 12 années plus tard, euh, l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies a adopté euh, euh, sous euh, le plaidoyer des peuples autochtones cette journée à statut que cette journée serait la journée internationale des peuples autochtones. Alors, euh, depuis ce temps-là, euh, tro les 370 millions euh, de peuples autochtones dans les 90 pays du monde, euh, à travers leurs représentants, leurs délégués euh, respectifs, ont eu euh, plus de chances de collaborer euh, pour pouvoir euh, porter plus haut euh, leurs euh, leur droits, donc la... la, 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 la les plaidoyers pour leurs droits, ce qui a abouti à la potentialisation des résultats de leur lutte. C'est ainsi que euh, deux décennies plus tard, donc après cette rencontre-là du 9 août 1982, avec euh, plusieurs euh, négociations avec les États membres, euh, les, ces délégués-là sont arrivés à euh, ce document euh, que nous célébrons, qui est la Déclaration des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. Alors, euh, ce, ce document, pour nous, c'est le cadre universel et les normes minimales pour la survie, la dignité et le bien-être des peuples autochtones. Et il n'est autre que euh, l'adaptation de la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme aux peuples autochtones, donc pour qu'ils aient les droits fondamentaux. Euh, 
cette année, euh, si nous revenons à, à, à quelques euh, cérémonies ou euh, événements qui ont marqué la célébration de, de ce dixième anniversaire, on a eu au niveau de l'instance permanente, je vais le dire brièvement parce que je suis sûre que la chef du secrétariat va revenir sur ça. Donc, euh, nous avons eu un groupe de travail parce que chaque année, nous avons une rencontre de groupe d'experts euh, sur un thème donné et cette année, ça a été euh, le rôle de l'instance permanente des Nations Unies euh, sur les questions autochtones dans la mise en œuvre de la déclaration. Cela a fait suite à, à une rencontre précédente en 2009, plutôt, sur euh, le même sujet, euh, dans le but de voir comment les différents mécanismes des Nations Unies et autres acteurs impliqués euh, dans la mise en œuvre de la déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones pourraient mettre leurs efforts ensemble pour une meilleure euh, application ou mise en œuvre de la déclaration. Également, nous avons eu euh, au cours euh, de, la, de, la, de la même année, où, pour notre session annuelle, son thème a porté sur euh, le dixième anniversaire de la déclaration et euh, nous avons consacré euh, une demi-journée de discussion à ce thème-là pour toujours dans le même but euh, pouvoir euh, appre euh, à voir euh, ce qui a été fait mais également ce qui pourrait euh, être amélioré pour une meilleure euh, mise en œuvre de la déclaration. Euh, le président de la 71e euh, Assemblée générale a également organisé euh, étant donné que c'est l'opportunité qu'on a d'avoir le plus grand nombre de peuples autochtones rassemblés au même endroit. Ce sont les sessions de l'instance permanente. Donc, on a profité euh, avec euh, euh, la grâce du président de l'Assemblée générale de pouvoir avoir cet événement de haut niveau euh, sur le dixième anniversaire qui nous a euh, permis euh, de pouvoir entendre non seulement les présidents euh, de, ou les, les des différents mécanismes des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones, mais également les représentants de cette région socioculturelle et géographique des peuples autochtones. Nous avons eu également des États membres qui ne se sont pas réservés quant à exprimer euh, le désir ou leurs efforts et la nécessité d'efforts à, 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 à élaborer, à mettre en œuvre pour euh, améliorer les droits des peuples autochtones qui sont à dans la déclaration des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. Mais ça, c'est ce qui se fait au niveau des Nations unies. Je me réjouis également de vous annoncer que, euh, d'après les échos que j'entends, il y a plein de préparatifs qui ont lieu pour célébrer euh, ce dixième anniversaire qui est le 13 septembre. Euh, donc, la déclaration a été adoptée le 13 septembre 2007 et puis là, ça serait déjà tout le long de l'année, mais j'entends beaucoup dans tous les continents, que ce soit ici dans les Amériques, mais également en Asie, en Amérique latine, euh, en Afrique, il y a beaucoup d'événements qui sont programmés pour euh, célébrer ce dixième anniversaire. Et euh, parallèlement à cette célébration, c'est également un bilan que nous dressons. Nous voulons voir ce qui a été fait. Nous, a, nous voulons également entendre ce qui n'a pas été fait. Et euh, en synthèse, nous voulons aussi euh, 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 apprendre de ceux qui font bien pour pouvoir euh, peut-être les jalouser, mais également juste apprendre de comment en, en, en sont-ils arrivés là, euh, qu'est-ce qui a marché, qu'est-ce qui, qu qui a été un blocage pour pouvoir euh, avancer la déclaration. Euh, donc, euh, toutes ces questions-là euh, euh, sont sur la table pour la célébration euh, de ce dixième anniversaire. Donc, concrètement, euh, au niveau... Il euh, y, a, y, a, y a eu plusieurs euh, éléments dans la dans les avancées de la mise en œuvre de la déclaration. Au niveau international, euh, nous avons eu un, un engagement formel. Euh, les États qui étaient même restés 
réticents à la déclaration, ont infléchi leur position par la suite. Et aujourd'hui, euh, nous nous réjouissons que euh, cela fait partie même de, pour certains, des bases de, de traiter avec les peuples autochtones. C'est le cas du Canada que je ne vais pas approfondir, puisque le chef euh, Wilton Little Child, lui-même qui a beaucoup évré, qui était un des commissaires de la euh, Commission Vérité et Réconciliation, pour laquelle euh, le document de base était la déclaration, va sûrement nous en parler. Mais euh, on a également au niveau international les, euh, les documents finaux de la, de la Conférence mondiale sur les peuples autochtones de 2014. Donc, elle aussi, elle a abouti à, à, à ces documents qui, euh, par exemple, a, 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 a conseillé euh, aux, aux organismes des Nations unies d'avoir le plan d'échelle à, à l'échelle, euh, le plan d'action à l'échelle du système des Nations unies qui a été présenté l'année passée à, à la 15e session de l'instance permanente et qui est largement diffusé actuellement. Donc, euh, c'est un programme que nous avons. Euh, au niveau national, donc au niveau des pays, nous avons plusieurs États qui se sont directement inspirés de la déclaration euh, pour euh, soit modifier euh, leur euh, constitution quant à la façon de voir les peuples autochtones, mais où euh, certains ont fait, apporté des modifications, en tout cas de façon générale. Euh, je ne vais pas citer des exemples là, sinon je prendrai le plus de temps que qu'il me faille, mais il y a également euh, le fait que la jurisprudence, euh, on, on fait recours beaucoup à la déclaration lors de, 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 de la jurisprudence. Donc, quand on traite de cas concrets au niveau des tribunaux, euh, que ce soit régionaux que et nationaux, et je et je vais pas euh, je vais pas pouvoir me retenir de vous exprimer ma joie d'entendre que la Cour africaine, tout récemment en 2017, est des de droits de l'homme et des peuples, est euh, statué à Arusha sur un cas de, de, de différents de ressources de, 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 de terre euh, qui avait été longtemps euh, disputé avec les peuples odiaques au, au Kenya. Et, et ça a été une victoire et la déclaration a directement servi comme, euh, comme document, comme instrument pour pouvoir euh, 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 en venir à, avec ce cas. Euh, il y a également euh, l'opportunité qui représente euh, pour les États, mais également au niveau international, l'agenda 2030 pour le développement, parce que euh, c'est et euh, euh, moi, je dirais que c'est un instrument euh, complémentaire à, à, à la déclaration parce que ça, est, aucun État ne veut ne pas se développer. Donc, on s'est tous entendus qu'on veut se développer. Et donc, euh, ici, euh, contre, contrairement aux objectifs du millénaire, il y a explicitement euh, allusion aux peuples autochtones dans, euh, dans l'agenda 2030 pour le développement. Et c'est encore euh, au niveau international une opportunité de pouvoir mettre la déclaration en œuvre. Euh, donc, finalement, euh, je, je vais euh, m'arrêter là pour pouvoir laisser un peu de temps à mes euh, autres euh, collègues de pouvoir s'exprimer. Je vais juste rappeler que euh, la Journée internationale des peuples autochtones est une occasion pour nous, peuples autochtones du monde entier, de pouvoir... Euh, euh, être en lien et pouvoir avancer euh, euh, la déclaration, mais également euh, nos droits de l'homme euh, de façon générale. Et euh, je suis contente d'entendre que partout dans le monde, euh, aujourd'hui, euh, il y a euh, des, des événements qui célèbrent cette journée-là. Merci. Thank you. Um, Grand Chief. Han tuu teemtik, nii ka on kahki jõuktatamist ka, et naa. A see, mida mis ta igi kui ei, ma mis kuuta mahkanud, ei miasek. Ma ta tahtas kiega jõu tihtama, kui kumu ja suu on. Eks na naskum on mis ta. I just bring you greetings in my language, the Cree language, to acknowledge your presence here on a very important 
and significant day for several reasons, as was just mentioned by my sister. Uh, the fact that we're sitting here honoring the 10th anniversary of the UN Declaration uh, on a very important day as well, historically. Because if you remember back in 1923 and 1925 when two indigenous leaders tried to get a voice at the United Nations, Chief Descahe in 1923, and then Ratana, a spiritual leader from the Maori. They couldn't get into the League of Nations as it was then known. From that time, 1923 to 1977, there was no voice for indigenous peoples. There was no voice to be heard internationally until 1977, when the second uh, delegation groups went to Geneva again to try and seek a voice. And one of the important early objectives in trying to secure that voice at the United Nations was not to only have a voice, but a permanent place where our voice could be heard at the UN. So an effort was launched to try and establish a permanent place at the United Nations. And we were blessed to be able to establish that permanent place, now called the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. But that journey also in 1977 was to try and get recognition on a set of principles for Indigenous peoples. Indeed, when we went there um, in 1977, we had already drafted a set of principles. So in 1982, when the working group was established, we offered those 10 principles on which a set of rights could be drafted. So the work actually starts in 1923, then it's quiet to 1977 to 1982 when the work on a declaration started. And the working group meetings, the day that we're honoring now, uh, August 9th, was very important because I remember that day actually when the chairperson asked the delegations, if this is about indigenous peoples, wouldn't it be important to hear from the indigenous peoples themselves? And actually that's when we were able to offer our suggestions for positive solutions to the challenges that were facing us globally. But when I reflect back on that journey, because for me now it's 40 years I've been on this journey. When I reflect back and I ask myself, what did we accomplish over these years? And then to narrow it down to the last 10 years, what have we accomplished during this decade of indigenous effort to seek the recognition, not only of our rights as indigenous peoples, but in many instances still seeking the recognition of indigenous peoples themselves as human beings. Actually, I also remember the day when we were actually for the first time, we were recognized as human beings. It was eight years of debate on whether or not indigenous peoples are human beings. And it revolved actually around one letter, and it's become kind of historic significance now. And that letter was the letter S, and whether it should be added to the word people. And I remember my elders saying, as I reported to them, well, what are we then if we're not peoples? Are we a herd of elk or moose or animals? What are we? And I said, well, they want to recognize us as societies, as groups, as ethnic minorities, uh, populations. And one of the elders said, I know why. I know why they don't want to recognize us as peoples. He said, if they do, they have to admit we're human beings. And if they admit we're human beings, they have to admit we have human rights. And that was an elder's observation of all our efforts uh, in the international arena to that point. So we're here on a historic day. 
But when I look back, I also ask, what have we contributed as indigenous peoples to humankind in this journey? Not only to search and try to seek recognition of us as human beings with human rights, but what have we offered to the world? And a couple of very significant contributions indigenous peoples made during this history of debate at the UN. The longest debated declaration in UN history, 27 years it took. So I remember, for example, being asked to go to the chairperson to ask if we could open the meeting with a prayer and to be told, Mr. Littlechild, you know we don't pray at the United Nations. And I said, well, it's not really a prayer, it's an invocation. We offer thanksgiving to Creator for blessing us with another beautiful day like today. And she said, well, how long is that going to take? And I said, I don't know, it's elders that present the honor. So anyway, she agreed. But to make a long story short, the outcome of that was the recognition of spiritual rights, that there's such a thing, not only of economic, social, and cultural rights, or civil and political rights, but also spiritual rights. It was our elders that offered that to humankind. So now, actually, every one of our meetings, every day, we start with a prayer at the UN. Then I remember an elder asking a delegation of states, 181, I think, were in the room, delegations. And he asked the delegations, which one of you is going to argue for my brother, the fish? Who among you is going to argue for my brother, the bird that flies, or the four-legged that die so we can live? Who among you is going to argue for clean air and clean water? You could hear a pin drop that day. It was so quiet in the room. But also that day marks the start of a consciousness at the UN about environmental protection. The very thing we're faced with today, the climate change discussions, that started with indigenous elders raising the issue. In fact, in Rio, when the first summit was held on the environment, it was indigenous peoples that played a key role. So I think and I believe that those two important contributions to humankind by our peoples during this journey of seeking recognition for ourselves as humans with human rights was an important contribution. Yes, we accomplished another significant uh, milestone, and that was the recognition of our inherent rights to self-determination, that these are inherent rights that you're born with. Then, of course, the milestone we're marking today the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples itself, the adoption of that. Now, when we look back on that decade, we look to the work of the Permanent Forum, for example, who in their second session already decided at the first session that women's rights should be an ongoing issue, cross-cutting issue. Then the next session, we brought in children's rights. That was indigenous leadership. Then we brought in persons with disabilities. So now those are ongoing important aspects of our discussions. Again, an important contribution. And here in the Americas, the notion of indigenous family was discussed and debated during the debates on the OAS Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where indigenous family Indigenous laws are for the first time recognized. But that's not only a benefit to Indigenous peoples, it's a benefit to all peoples that family is an important central uh, foundation of society. But also the recognition of Indigenous laws, because sometimes, for example, in our songs, laws are carried in our culture. So the milestone that we honor today at home was also a fundamental reason why we actually went to the United Nations. The reason I went to the United Nations in 1977 was because of my elders instructed me that they were concerned about treaty violations. 
Treaties were being breached on a daily basis, they said. Very concerned. So we need to go back to the international arena. After all, our treaty is with Her Majesty Queen Victoria, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It's an international treaty. So that's why we went. So the outcome of that is we had a nine-year study at the UN on treaties. Professor Alfonso, the late Professor Alfonso Martinez did a study on treaties. So these are historical accomplishments that are culminating now on this 10th year in a very good way. And I'll address later the change that's been happening in my country, in Canada, Gaganata, as we say in my language, the clean land, about the implementation of the UN Declaration, how things are changing uh, in a very positive direction in my country in terms of implementation of the UN Declaration. Because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that just concluded its work, as was mentioned, we made 94 calls to action. 16 of those calls to action are on the UN Declaration itself and how to implement the UN Declaration. So we've had these um, uh, accomplishments, I think, and in recognition, uh, a couple others that we uh, offered to the world was at the World Health Organization. Health, from the indigenous perspective, is a holistic perspective. That is not only about physical health, but also mental health, cultural health, and very importantly, spiritual health. So these four dimensions as a holistic perspective, what we call the medicine wheel, also was an offering to the World Health Organization for the first time to look at an indigenous perspective of health. And of course, the inclusion of food as a part of our ceremony, uh, our feasts that we hold in our communities at the uh, FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization at their World Summit, uh, for the first time heard that food is not only for eating, it's also for spiritual ceremony. So these are indigenous perspectives we've offered to, uh, to the world that I think were important milestones that we celebrate today on a 10th anniversary uh, of the UN Declaration and also uh, to mark the special day when the working group uh, started in Geneva to discuss, uh, are indigenous peoples actually human beings? Mm -hmm. And do they have rights? And of course now we're here with a loud and clear yes to both of those. So thank you very much for your uh, joining us today in this marking of a very, very important milestone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Chandra? Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for being here with us. It's a great privilege for me to actually be sitting here with my two, two chairpersons, um, with the current chairperson of the forum, Ms. Uh, Mariam Waletabu Bakreen. In a way, from what uh, Chief Wilton Littlechild uh, mentioned in terms of how at the forum the work has progressed, in a way I feel that Ms. Abu Bakreen embodies that in terms of being a young indigenous woman, mm -hmm. professional, yet a very strong advocate for these rights. Chief Wilton Littlechild, when I first went to the UN, just to give a little bit of a personal perspective on this, uh, I was also among those indigenous advocates who first joined the UN in Geneva in the 1990s, much, much later. And for us, when we saw Chief Wilton Littlechild and when he speaks, I have seen him continuously for how many years, and he never ceases to amaze and inspire me because <laughs> it's uh, something that we always look up to for all the indigenous uh, advocates and representatives who come. Just to mention a little bit that Chief Wilton Littlechild and Ms. Mariam Abu Bakreen have been and were members of the Permanent Forum. 
and also of the expert mechanism. And I just wanted to round up a little bit to say that in addition to the permanent forum, one of the achievements, as the Chief Wilton Little Child pointed out, is the UN actually took on board with great attention the demands of the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the permanent forum, which was in response to calls for the, a permanent place at the UN, because earlier the working group that everybody, the indigenous representatives went to in Geneva was a working group of the subcommission of the commission, which was uh, did not carry as much weight as indigenous peoples wanted it to. And that was why the demands were the, for the forum to be placed at the level where it is now arose. Now, we also have in the, uh, 2002, we also have the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is part of the Special Procedures Mechanism. We then had the what we have now is the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, which is in a way following on from the work of the working group. And it has since, as our chairperson mentioned in 2014, we had the UN organized for the first time a world conference on indigenous peoples. It was a high level event known as the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. This was served uh, to mobilize attention because you had in 2014, you had many things happening, yet at the same time, there were many developments taking place. And in addition, there ha were noticeable shifts and changes in how indigenous peoples were being recognized in different countries. For instance, uh, Chief Wilton Littlechild referred to Canada as also changing their position. And this in a way is significant because you had four countries that voted against the adoption of the declaration in 2007. Yet all four have changed the positions and now do support the declaration. And this is very significant signifying, demonstrating that what happens at one given point is not necessarily written in stone, and that there are changes, there are trends. And the reason for these changes, I would like to say, are mainly due to the efforts of the indigenous peoples in those countries themselves. Of course, with the help of other supporters and others, and this comes back to the point that Chief Little Child raised at the UN. The UN provides the space, the fora, the opportunity, as was mentioned by the chairperson. Mm -hmm. Yet, the UN also strives to be flexible and responsive, and it is driven by the requests that come in, by the voices that are heard, the demands that are made, the challenges that need to be addressed. And that is why, as we move forward into the next 10 years of the declaration, we do note that there are many challenges that remain at the UN, at the forum, at the expert mechanism, also with the special rapporteur, we continue to hear reports of indigenous people's rights that have been violated, indigenous women that are placed under severe stress, violence, hardship, and also in terms of others who are defending their own rights that also do face challenges. And this is where I believe that for the next 10 years of the declaration, as each year we celebrate the International Indigenous Peoples Day, which provides uh, an opportunity for not just at the UN, but as the chairperson pointed out, there are also celebrations more and more in different countries around the world, in Asia, in Africa, here in the US and in other parts of the world. But as we go into the next decade, next 10 years, I believe that you know we still have to continue our efforts and we still have a lot more that we need to do. And with the new development agenda for 2030, which is in itself an advance in terms that it actually recognizes and particularly references indigenous peoples, which is a step up from the MDGs. And so that in itself came about because indigenous peoples were very much there, raised their voices, lobby to the member states and in response we have in the development agenda for 2030 there are references to indigenous peoples in terms of education in terms of health but of course as chief wilton little child pointed out indigenous people's rights are holistic and they embrace all aspects of culture spirituality gender 
resource rights. So these are all aspects that have to be taken into, account, into account so that in the development agenda for 2030, as we move forward into the next 10, nine years, 15 years to 2030, we will be able to take more cognizance, more recognition, more inclusion of indigenous people's rights as outlined in the declaration.